the beginning of the 20th century, it was socially acceptable for women to work outside the home, but generally only if they were unmarried. For most women, a job filled in their time between leaving school and being married and starting a family. Many poor and working class wives, however, had to work outside the home to supplement the family income. Since jobs for women were supposed to be temporary, women were often employed in jobs that required lower level skills. These jobs offered fewer opportunities for promotion and paid lower salaries than men's jobs. In 1901, over 13% of Canadian workers outside the home were women. The majority worked as domestic servants or in factories, mills, and sweatshops of the clothing industry. Businesses such as banks were reluctant to hire women for jobs where customers expected to deal with male employees. Adelaide Hunter Hoodless was born on a farm in Brant County, Ontario in 1857. Like many women, Hoodless believed that women had a natural destiny in the home and did not support the suffragette cause. Rather, she and others like her fought for causes that would improve women's role in the home. After her youngest child died in 1889 from drinking impure milk, Hoodless was determined to help women learn proper sanitation, child care, and home management. In the 1890s and early 1900s, she worked in support of pure milk legislation and public health reform. She persuaded school boards to teach courses in domestic science for girls and manual training for boys. She helped found a national YWCA, the National Council of Women, and the Victorian Order of Nurses. Members of women's organizations actively lobbied for women's rights to be educated and to work at any job. Many also supported the struggle for women's suffrage, that is, the right for women to vote and to hold elected office. Dr. Emily Howard Stowe, Canada's first woman doctor, helped to establish Canada's first women's suffrage organization in 1876. The largest role played by women during the war was replacing men who had gone overseas in essential jobs in factories and on farms at home. 30,000 women worked in munitions factories and thousands more worked for the government or worked on farms. Yet, even in the face of labor shortages, it was sometimes difficult in the early years of the war for women to get jobs in factories. Many labor unions fought hard against hiring women because they feared that women would take jobs away from men after the war. When women did get jobs, they were often paid less than half what a man earned during the same job. The war greatly influenced the struggles started earlier in the century for women's suffrage. Working outside the home also proved to women that they were capable of doing many of the same jobs as men. As a result, increasing number of women became convinced that they should have an equal share in making political decisions. In 1917, in an effort to win votes, the Union government under Robert Borden passed the Wartime Elections Act, granting the mothers, sisters, daughters, and wives of soldiers the right to vote in federal elections. During the election campaign, in an effort to win more votes, Borden promised to extend the right to vote to all women over 21. By the end of the war, the right to vote in federal as well as in most provincial elections was extended to most women. Native and Asian women, like Native and Asian men, still did not have the right to vote. Women played an invaluable role in keeping the country functioning during the war. Yet, when the war ended, many of them lost their non-traditional jobs. They were expected to return to the home to their traditional roles. Women, however, had experienced what they could do when they were given a chance. There was no turning back. Following the war, women became increasingly active in social work, teaching, and public health. Some of them sought careers in medicine, journalism, and law.
During the 1920s, women in growing numbers became involved in physical activities and organized sports. They joined athletic clubs, formed sports teams, and took part in school sports. Sunnyside Stadium in Toronto drew 6,000 spectators for women's baseball. Crowds for men's games were often not as large. The Edmonton Grads, a women's basketball team founded in 1915, played teams from around the world. In 1928, women were allowed to compete for the first time in track and field events in the Olympics. Women's fashions in the 1920s reflected the new freedom of the time. Women took up a wider range of work and began to socialize more freely. Many smoked, had bobbed or very short hair, and wore short dresses. Such behavior would have been considered scandalous a generation earlier. Most women in Canada could vote in provincial and federal elections by the early 1920s, but very few women were elected to office. Most women had won the right to run for election to the House of Commons in 1918. Four women ran at the first opportunity, the 1921 election. Only one, Agnes MacPhail, was victorious. For 14 years, MacPhail was the only member of Parliament. In the 1921 federal election, Agnes MacPhail, running for the Progressive Party, won her seat in rural Ontario. MacPhail served as an MP until her defeat in 1940. MacPhail was a strong internationalist and the first Canadian woman to serve as a League of Nations delegate. She also served as an Ontario MPP in the 1940s and 1950s. Her long career and her contributions were recognized in 1954 when she was to be appointed to the Canadian Senate, but she died before the appointment was made. I feel rather strange just sitting here in this Manitoba legislature. This, this woman has been alive and experienced the mock women. trial that has happened women in the late 1920s. Vote. You'd have to go back a long way to know how women have been down, what we'd call downgraded today, over the centuries. But this is the mythology of the period. Women were supposed to obey. Women were housewives. Women were not in public life. Women were not in business. Women could do some office work, uh, but uh, paid uh, with less than half the wages that the men would be paid, even if they were doing the same thing. Women were just uh, uh, not capable. And, and, uh, I don't know, think that they said that they were uh, a lower breed. Uh, they couldn't do that very well, but uh, just incapable. And uh, they went one day to see Sir Rodman Robland, who was the premier of Manitoba at that time, and to ask him to enfranchise women in this province. And, of course, he was uh, uh, very much opposed to it. Uh, he thought it was ridiculous. He told them that, that how absurd and foolish they were. He used some very uncomplimentary words according to the papers of that day. And uh, there's no doubt that it was true, uh, that um, he just uh, couldn't conceive of uh, women uh, going out and voting. What would they vote for? And, uh, of course, men continued for quite some time believing that their wives ought to vote as they told them to. Probably they did. Uh, I don't know how else it could be, and uh, since they have agreed, or, uh, we would have had uh, some other changes before this time. And uh, there's no objection particularly to that. Well, he made such a fuss over it, uh, and was so um, it was so repugnant to him that it got into the papers. Of course, the opposition papers were very glad to have this story. And Nellie McClung decided that she would put on a mock parliament down in uh, the uh, Walker Theatre. Nellie McClung was a very colorful uh, sort of speaker, an unusual thing, uh, having a woman that could go about and address an audience anywhere. It just happened that my mother and I were visiting in Winnipeg at that time, and so I was able to be at the uh, mock parliament that night. 
And my recollection of it was that Nellie McClung uh, moving about as uh, the premier and the women sitting on the platform as the members of the house and uh, they were um, deciding whether they should allow men to vote or not. Were men really capable? Wouldn't they go out and make fools of themselves? Uh, they'd, they'd just vote against what women wanted probably and uh, uh, it would be disastrous to business and everything else and uh, uh, it was it was uproariously funny uh, 